matter what tragedy that befalls you or opportunity or whatever stresses you out, and we're all human, that's about being it. If you looked at it from the outside, you'd probably chuckle at it if it was in a sitcom or something of that nature. So we have to gain our own perspective in life. But you know what? Find a way to laugh a couple times a day. I think it's the greatest thing you can do for a long life and a happy life. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Thrive Stayed Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. V, triple board certified MD and performance and longevity expert. And today is a very special episode being shot at SoFi Stadium. So if you're listening on audio, I know you can't see it, but for those that are on the YouTube channel, uh, I'm going to just pan around. You can see this huge SoFi sign right behind me. It's an empty stadium. Uh, love being here with my coach. Uh, David Meltzer um, to create content and doing a lot of good stuff uh, as we impact more people to be happier and healthier. Now, on today's podcast, we take a little veer and direction and talk about health, but not from a personal perspective, more from a data and information management perspective. Yes, we'll be talking about digital health. We'll be talking to the CEO of the Health Information Management Systems Society, uh, or HIMS, and we'll be talking and getting his insight on the role of digital health, how artificial intelligence and how technology is shaping digital health, how it actually increases access for everyday people to get health and the direction of digital health in the future. Now, if you're new to this podcast, welcome in. The Thrive State Podcast is really a place where I bring in thought leaders in the health longevity, and personal development space to give you the tools, the insight, the tactics, the mindset shift so that you can live your best life. It's where you go to get insights to more health, more happiness, to elevate our human potential. Now, if you're returning to the podcast and if this podcast has given you value, please consider helping the show grow by giving a five-star review wherever podcasts are listened to. Now, if you don't already know or have a copy of my book, the second edition of my book, Thrive State, Your Blueprint for Optimal Health, Longevity, and Peak Performance has released on April 11, 2023, and it's a number one bestseller on Amazon. So please pick up your copy today. We really go into the factors and the areas you need to focus on to create this energetic state within yourself to bring you better health performance, and anything you want in life. The second edition has expanded content of how you could take your energy and expand it into your families, your teams, and your organizations. And they also share a framework to let you create lasting change and create this energetic state of love, abundance, and health in your life. So again, pick up your copy of Thrive State, the second edition at Amazon or wherever books are sold. Now, on today's podcast, I have Carol Wolf, also known as Hal. He's the president and CEO of HIMSS, which is the Health Information and Management Systems Society. He's a global advisor and thought leader supporting the transformation of the health ecosystem through information and technology. Mr. Wolf is respected internationally as a healthcare and informatics leader with areas of expertise in health, product development, integrated care models, marketing, distribution, information technology, and large-scale innovation implementation. Before joining HIMSS, Wolf served as the Director and Practice Leader of Information and Digital Health Strategy. Prior to the Chartist Group, he served as Senior Vice President and COO of Kaiser Permanente. It was actually the first job I had as an attending physician where he represented over 16,000 physicians. Wolf has also held positions at MTV Networks and Time Warner and served as the senior advisor at McKinsey and Company. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a very unique conversation discussing the role and the future of digital health. Please enjoy this Thrive State podcast with Hal Wolf. Hello, Hal Wolf. Welcome to the Thrive State Podcast. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, it's so a pleasure to, to have you. It's a pleasure to have you. It's a pleasure to have a leader 
in the healthcare space. And I know people don't really get a chance to know about the information or management systems behind the delivery of healthcare, which is why it's a treat to have you here today. But before we dive in uh, to, to the meat of the podcast, we do a segment on the show called The Five to Thrive. Five quick questions just to know how Wolf, as a person, a little bit uh, closely. And if you win The Five to Thrive, usually people win a uh, a very healthy dinner on me. I know I'll be seeing you in Chicago in a couple of weeks. So my question to you, how Wolf, are you ready to pay, play the five to thrive. Sure, let's give it a go and I'll do my best. Here we go. Question number one for 1,000 points is, <laughs> what did Hal Wolf want to be growing up as a child? Ah, really good question. Um, actually, I wanted to be a lawyer focusing in on maritime law. I grew up in Florida until I was 14 years old. I spent a lot of time in Jacksonville, Florida and Tampa. So I spent a lot of time on the water and maritime law fascinated me. So that was what I was thinking about early on. Oh, very good. 1,000 points there. For the second question is, what has been one transformational book that you read during your lifetime that made you have a huge shift on how you see the world? Oh, that's an easy one. Um, it was a book that I read when I was going to think about 23 or 24 and the title of it was if it isn't broken break it oh and i love that it, yeah and it was an interesting thing the book was not nearly as good as the title but the title was something in there that really just fundamentally taught me that whenever you go into a situation and everyone says it's great it's fine don't touch it take a hard look at it you know, don't accept things exactly as they are. Understand what the conditions are that drove you to the success that you know, the people are dealing with. And then, you know, come to an understanding that they may come to an end. And so that just had an influence on me. And I've actually mm. uh, found that book again, which is great. It's still up on my library. And I reference it from time to time. Well, that's great. That's what we talk about on this podcast a lot is is not assuming that the programs or the rules that we've been given uh, growing up in life is is uh, is truth or dogma and to question everything and to make choices, new choices that might lead to new possibilities down the road. So I like that. 2000 points thus far. You're, you're on your way of winning dinner with me. Question number three is if you were stuck in an elevator and had one thing from the outside world to keep you company for 24 hours, what would that be? Probably one of my dogs. Oh, which yeah. one and what and what, what breed is that dog? Well, I have two right now. I have a Siberian Husky and um, I have a Great Pyrenees. So yeah. the right answer would be the Pyrenees because he's very <laughs> calm, very protective. On the downside, he's pretty big. So it does depend on the size of the elevator. <laughs> um, but I'll I'll go with Sherman, the Pyrenees. Uh, sounds good. Question number four for, for another thousand. No, 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 no. I can't go to number four until I know how I scored on number three. Oh, you, so far you're three for three. You've got <laughs> okay, 3,000 okay. and, and you've got two more questions to go. The question number four is if I were to put you on stage with 5,000. Actually, if I were to put you on stage right here, I'm on the field of SoFi Stadium. And yeah. give you the mic to sing one karaoke song. What song would would you pick? Oh, that's a real good one. It would either be "I've Got You Under My Skin," which is a Ooh. Frank mm -hmm. Sinatra solid, or "On the Street Where You Live" from My Fair Lady. You've got me under your skin. Very good. Four thousand points. I would give you extra bonus points the next time you sing a. a, a, a a line from that song. The last question I have for you, Hal Wolf, is how does Hal Wolf want to be remembered? Well, you know, I don't know sometimes whether or not it's about me personally being remembered. Mm. Um, but I think what I'd like to know is that I've had a chance to make a little bit of difference. You know, I think the, the neat part about what we all do in healthcare, and this is really what drives me every single day, to be frank with you, and I think, frankly, the mass majority, if not every single member of the HIMS community, whether it's inside HIMS or just everyone in our 120,000 members. But yeah, you wake up in the morning and you have a chance in healthcare 
and in health every single day just to make a little bit of a difference. You don't have to change everything, but if you can make a one or 2% difference, that arc over time comes pretty powerful. And so that's what we got to do every single day. It's complex. It's big. Just make a little bit of difference. Oh, that's amazing. And I know you're making a big difference, a huge as we're recording this, the um, big global international conference is happening in Chicago um, starting April 17th. And I know you've got conferences all around the world. First of all, you won the Five to Thrive. So the next time we meet, I'd love to share a very healthy meal on me. So now I just want to dive in a little bit uh, um, into what you do. You are the CEO and founder of HIMSS, that's H-I-M-S-S, which is the Healthcare Information and Management Systems Society. Um, so I also understand as I was doing a little research for this podcast that you were the CEO for a company that I used to work for when I was an interventional radiologist, which is Kaiser Permanente. So would you let me know a little bit about your professional background and what made you start and found him to begin with? Well, well, first of all, I'm, I'm not a founder of him. So let me give you a little background on that. And I apologize for it, but it's important. Uh, HIMSS was started in 1961 by a group of professors at Georgia Tech University who had this crazy idea that you could use data and information from the computer to be able to do analysis on the improvement of healthcare mm -hmm. and to be able to also use it in the background to figure out what to do next. And so they were real trailblazers. And so HIMSS really started from an academic and computer science standpoint it's why we've always had at least one foot in the technology space. Um, and over that time, of course, it's grown uh, dramatically. So I would love, love <laughs> to have taken uh, credit for founding, but I have just been incredibly fortunate over the last five plus years now uh, to have the chance to lead um, HIMSS and to be a part of our entire membership universe uh, which is continuing to grow, grow globally. So that's really the cool part on that. And, and what that's was the second, and the second part of your question? Oh, yeah, just a little bit of your background. I know you were the oh, CEO yeah. for, for Kaiser Permanente. I knew when I was there, um, just having an electronic yeah. medical uh, record system that, that is spoken to from people all around the system to be able to have that, that easy access. I left yeah. Kaiser Permanente very soon after and realized that out in the private world, we didn't have that. So how did you take that experience and your professional experience in, into your direction at, over at Hims? Well, you know, I, I started at Kaiser about 20 years ago as a CIO in here in the Colorado region, which where I'm sitting right now. And my first assignment um, was I came in about six months before we launched what would be the epic, um, but the second electronic medical record that this region was going to have. And it already had an older IBM model that was there. It was built in, it was a DOS-based program. And it was actually built in everyone's lexicon. It was, um, you know, sitting there with the comments about what well, we need to F2 them, you know, things like that, mm. short cuts that were coming up. Um, but I came from sort of the innovation side, if you would, of the healthcare industry. I started mm. off years ago at MTV Networks, and then I was at home shopping, and then Time Warner really in the development of what we call today video on demand. And so every time you pull a little phone up, I had a wonderful opportunity to participate with an amazing team of innovators. So being on that cutting edge is just sort of innovation and how do we move things forward? That was the scope in which I came into Kaiser. And what an astounding organization. Uh, 20 years ago was a time we were taking on a full electronic medical record, which was you know, thought provoking at the time, nine million members cutting it across the eight regions that existed at KP at that time. I did that job um, for a couple of years. It was fantastic. And then the organization came to me and asked, do you really want to learn healthcare? We'd love to get you in operations. So I moved over to be head of administration for the medical group in uh, Colorado, and then eventually the chief operating officer of what was known as the Permanente Federation, which is the group that works across all of the doctors. So when you were a physician, uh, there was your medical group in Southern Cal, and then just above it, working and coordinating across 
all the other medical groups, uh, was the Permanente Federation, and that's where I was chief operating officer. What I was able to glean from it is that the use of information and technology, critical, critical, critical um, in every single healthcare system, which was almost uniquely a Kaiser or an Intermountain type environment, has really, in Cleveland Clinic and other trailblazers, has really become, you know, established as a global standard. How do we get to that and improve on top of it? And so, so much of that focus was actually back then around what was happening in the clinics. It was definitely an inside out point of view. And of course, today, I think we are beginning to incorporate even more of the outside in point of view from the individual patient and bringing it back in. So mm. uh, those days were fantastic. I had an amazing mentor and a gentleman by the name of Dr. Michael Chase. I always bring his name up. He was head of quality in Colorado. Uh, and he was so wonderfully exuberant and patient with me. And I learned so much about care on a daily basis through him and the incredible organization that existed. You know, it is pretty fascinating, you know, as, as a doctor and also as a patient, I, I know just the, the vast amount of information and data that is necessary to really understand human physiology. How, how do you convey that to other people? How do you keep that information safe? With artificial intelligence that is basically kind of taking over all of technology in the future, what, where do you find the role of digital health is and how do you find it changing now that uh, technology has really sort of exponentially grown uh, over the last couple of years? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's a great question. So digital health has a lot of promise behind it, and I think a lot of it's starting to be fulfilled. Um, I go back to saying, you know, well, what is it we're asking digital health to do? And when we look at it, we start then with, well, what are the problems we're trying to solve? So, you know, fundamentally, the challenges in the global health ecosystem haven't changed dramatically. We've been doing very good things with it. In some cases, not as much progress, but it all starts with our aging population. You know this so well. Mm -hmm. Our silver tsunami, I'm a part of that. Um, we have a growing senior um, individuals, 50 and above. It's happening every single day, living longer. And because they're living longer, they're getting yeah. a lot more chronic disease, right? And we're a heck of a lot better at identifying chronic disease than we were before. So we recognize this burden, got huge challenges in geographic displacement, you know, all around the world. This is a big issue for everybody. And it does not mean rural only. We have far too many people that live in the shadows of astounding facilities like the one that you worked in that may not have access to it. Um, we have a lack of actionable information. It's getting better, but we learned this in the last pandemic. I mean, we did not have the information we needed to really tackle COVID out of the gate. We had to crap, you know, put it all together and craft something. We have massive staff shortages. You know, we do not have the number of clinicians that we need. Yeah, enough, you know, nurse practitioners, primary care doctors are retiring. All of that is happening. And we have funding systems that just cannot keep up with the demand. All of that on top of now an educated consumer that's used to doing a lot more on their own digital health platform. And we're trying to catch up. Uh, the place where you and I work did a really good job with it, but it goes even farther than that. And so people are working super hard, I think, to get to it. So then we have to look up and we say, okay, well, what are we going to do with this? And how can we take digital health and make it a part of this change? And what are we, how are we going to tackle it? And I really think it gets down to a strategic level, but what digital health has a chance to do from my basic, you know, view here is that when you think about the paradigm we grew up in, which is an effect and encounter-based paradigm, this idea where if I'm going to get treatment, I need to be in front of somebody. Um, it just doesn't measure up. It's not going to happen. The numbers are against it. The global gap in the number of clinicians can, you know, continues to rise. Um, we have to do something different. So digital health has an amazing opportunity to step into that space, to help individuals, to get the information people need at the right time and place, to drive better outcomes, drive better access. 
And there's, there's issues behind that. There's strategies that have to be executed. We can get into that in our conversation. There are areas that we can go into, you know, that help support why digital health, but that at the highest level, tackling, you know, geographic displacement, helping support scope of practice changes, figuring out how non-hospital-based care can be derived. These are really critical and we need every tool in the tool book to do it. I think, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has really accelerated the process of people adapting clinical health. I know uh, in my concierge practice, I definitely went more of a virtual model, which I find it was a lot easier on me as I was, you know, a concierge doctor driving to different places in Los Angeles and traffic, taking care of my patients to a more um to, to a more virtual model where they, ha they had easier access to me, more frequent access to me. So we could see how that has opened up access to care. Now, the people in this community who are listening to this podcast are uh, probably interested in how digital health affects them. So I'd love to, to, to talk about sort of personal digital health in the future. But I know one of the questions that, that arises from digital health is interoperability. There's so many programs and so many venues out there. As a radiologist, previously, I had access to a lot of digital data, but certain digital data that, that I've gotten from one machine, I can't read it in a different machine. And so how do you find the, the problem of interoperability or the challenge of that being solved in the future? This episode of the Thrive State podcast is brought to you by the Thrive State Accelerator. The Thrive State Accelerator is actually a home course that I developed using the exact same techniques I work with my celebrity clients, CEOs, and executives on how to get them to the Thrive State. The Thrive State Accelerator teaches you how to master your seven bioenergetic elements. That's sleep, nutrition, movement, stress and emotional mastery, relationships, our thoughts and mindset, as well as purpose. In this Thrive State Accelerator, you're also going to get a bonus module on optimization. That's how I talk about supplementation, peptides, all the optimization techniques I use with my clients to get them to the Thrive State. Now, for some of you who are just joining us for the first time, you guys might be wondering, what is the Thrive State? Well, the Thrive State is actually the energy the epigenetic environment we give to ourselves, telling ourselves, telling our DNA how to act and how to respond. And if we want optimal health, longevity, and peak performance, if we can master these seven bioenergetic elements, our ability to have those three things that we just said, optimal health, longevity, and peak performance is at its greatest. And it also prevents you from getting chronic symptoms like brain fog, being overweight, feeling sluggish, acne, pain, all these chronic symptoms, as well as preventing you from getting chronic disease. So getting to that thrive state is really getting to that state to master being that very best version of yourself so you could show up for you, for your family, for your business, everything that's important to you. So go ahead, check it out right now at kianbu.com slash accelerator and use coupon code podcast25 for 25% off. Now back to the podcast. First of all, you know, there's there's four different layers to interoperability. We have to keep that in mind. We've got the foundational layer, structure layer, semantic, and organizational. Uh, because really inside your own organization, you can have gaps in governance and, and, and communication. But if you're listening to this from a consumer point of view, what interoperability fundamentally means is the ability of one system to another to talk to each other. And you know to get information, and this is not a technology problem. Let's be really clear; it's not. Um, about last year, at this time, roughly, I remember looking up on my television set at home, and there was a beautiful 4K stream from a helicopter being brought to me live from the surface of Mars, right into my living room clear mm. as well. And then later that day, um, a family member of mine got frustrated because they couldn't get his electronic medical record across the parking lot. Yeah. We don't have a technology problem. Interoperability exists. Mm. We know what to do. We have to have the will to do it. And there are challenges to it. But to your point, it has to occur interoperability and fundamental health technology alliances 
have to come in so that we can call a rose a rose. And I'm just putting in the most simplistic language, which we call, you know, semantic interoperability. It's kind of that third mm. level of definitions are publicly available. But in the guts of a machine and in the guts of a fundamental, um, you know, system that's working at a foundational level is just so the data can talk to each other, that the requirements and the securely information are secured and passed. And then finally, in structural is what we call syntax or the origin of data. All of that is how we deal with interoperability. So that if I have something that takes place on my watch or my phone, it can flow easily into the record or, the, or a utility that my doctor is using. An alarm can go off and someone can say, hey, let's get them in here. We really need to talk to them now. Mm. Uh, so good. In terms of a consumer, you know, uh, facing uh, question here, what do you think, how would digital health change the way that they receive health this year and next year? And might, what might be some resources um, that they could turn to if they want to access more of the, you know, I, I, I know certain people that I, we know digital health is here. We know people are on their, their phones or app, but what are they actually doing? I still have to call in uh weeks in advance to get an appointment with my doctor and, and even then the communication isn't going very well so are are there um consumer inspired in uh ways that they could be more active and participate in digital health well i i think your first inclination is the right one which is you know even though if you're weeks away i would sit down with you know my physician or my medical ecosystem and say look these are the things I want to track on my own. Do you have any applications you'd recommend or do you have any particular data points I should be looking at? Most physicians nowadays have a few up their sleeves, you know, clinicians, nurse practitioners. These are what we use is what I use. Um, so they're out there. Read the reviews as well. But also remember that no matter what you do from that personal level, um, this is good information in or bad information in produces good information out, right? So always take everything with a slight grain of salt. But all that being said, we're beginning to see the development of, you know, of AI, artificial intelligence, machine learnings, which is taking a culmination of a lot of information and a lot of knowledge that is being created every single day around the globe. And with little bits of information from you can give you warning signs or give you general mm. directions. And there's a very clear delineation, especially in the United States, between applications that are giving you health advice. Those are controlled appropriately so, you know, by the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, and they carry with them, you know, really important uh, warning signs that say this is information, you know, that can affect your health. And they have to be regulated. Then there's a ton of wonderful applications that also exist in this ever-expanding ecosystem that actually can help you whether you know not sleeping well or diet or how much exercise am I getting? We need to remember that 40% of a person's health is what you do on a daily basis. It's your activity. You know this. You just tempted me with a wonderfully healthy and nutritious meal, you know, which I'm going to guess are not hot dogs in the wonderful stadium that you're standing in right now. I'm just going to go out on a limb. Throw that out there. But basically <laughs> what happens was these applications can help you, you know, with that fundamental daily life choices that you make. And that's 40 percent of who you are. The other 30 percent of who you are, it's just your genomics. I mean, you're going to have predispositions. Predispositions does not mean you're guaranteed you're going to have a problem. The predispositions, those two together, at 70 percent of the impact on you, about 20 percent is roughly your social ecosystem, your social determinants of health. Yeah. By the time you get to, you know, the physician in front of you, it's about a 10% impact on your overall and long-term health. So we need to recognize there's a lot we can do from a prevention standpoint. And those applications that you find at a personal level, they can help you in your personal behavior, understanding, you know, what your predispositions are and go from there. I find what you just said so empowering um uh, because i you know 
I am a physician. I am an MD trained in traditional medicine. But, you know, I over, you know, seven years ago, my story was I was overweight, diabetic, had high blood pressure on prescription medications, realizing that I didn't really have the tools to be healthy. And what I soon then discovered is my own power to activate the genes of longevity and performance. And a lot of that is basically how I live my day to day life with my sleep, nutrition, movement my sense of its community and how I'm serving the world. And, and that, like you said, you know, constitute, you know, 90% of, of, of the information that we're giving ourselves in a moment to moment basis. That's exactly right. And, and look, here's, here's the neat part about the information and knowledge space that we're in today that wasn't there before. If you go back to the early 1970s, there were effectively three publications that were produced around the globe with peer review articles that physicians, you know, and clinicians were put in front of, whether it was New Journal, you know, New England Journal of Medicine, you have the Lancet report coming out of, you know, England, etc. We were producing roughly about 400 peer review articles a year. So if you were a very diligent clinician, you could read about an article a day and keep up. This year, there'll be over 10,000 peer review articles from all around the globe that are being published. There's no way that the individual clinician, no matter how brilliant, bright, and capable they are, can keep up. So we utilize digital health, we utilize research in order to take pieces of information and put them together come to new understandings and new conclusions that help us understand our health and the health around us literally daily. And that's why all this digital health in the back end of clinical decision support and why interoperability is so important is so that if something is discovered last week and it's a, something that you need to know this week, it can get to you. It can help mm. you. With it. And that's transformational. And that is something that we're all beginning to see it unfold right in front of our eyes. It's very exciting. It is super exciting. You know, I came across an interview in which you've discussed the importance of mentoring in your career. Now, this career that, you know, or this space that you're in is constantly changing um, ever so quickly. Uh, who have, can you share some insights about a mentor that you currently have or who has influenced you in your professional journey and where you want to take hymns. Yeah, I'd be happy to. I mean, well, first of all, I, I mentioned uh, Dr. Chase. I don't mean to embarrass him, but, you know, an inspiration every day and thinking about, you know, how do we look to the future and how do we integrate it? And really, how do we marry these two critical moments between what I call the medical model, where we work inside hospitals, et cetera, and the health model? which you exemplify every single day in your own personal story. So Mike was really terrific in helping me understand how those two pieces came together. Another gentleman who I, I have great fortune of knowing is Dr. Hans Klugo is going to be with us in Chicago. Mm -hmm. He is the regional director of the WHO in Europe. An amazing story, a family of physicians who spent his entire career essentially helping individuals less fortunate than him and now really leading an effort with 53 countries in the EU region, you know, not just the EU, but the European region all together, and really driving them towards elements of equity and, and through the use of digital health and interoperability to create equity as much as possible. And we'll continue that fight forward. So you'll see him on stage. He'll be there Tuesday with me and a couple of other times and I'm really fortunate to have them there. And then quite frankly, I worked in so many amazing facilities in my life. I just look at each individual that's lifting the weight of health every single day as individual mentors and inspiration as well. You find them everywhere. You find them at the front desk. You find them as a nurse practitioner. Yeah. You find them working in the lab. You find them in the IT shop. You find them sitting somewhere inventing some new application because they have a dream and they want to make an impact. And so I find those exciting uh, mentors as well. 
I, I love that you can find inspiration in teaching in every moment and in, in every person in life. Let's talk a little bit more about hymns and what people can expect from coming to a hymns conference. This is a very large conference. I think you guys are expecting thirty to 40,000 people. What type of uh, corporations or individuals do you find coming? And what type of collaborations do you find stemming from 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 you know all the interaction at the conference? Oh, that's that's a great question. Um, so let's talk about what Hymns does, and it might explain a little bit, you know, about what people are actually going to see when they get a chance to come up, you know, and be a part of that Hymns ecosystem and what's going to be in front of them. Um, so when I look up and I look at what Hymns stands for, you have to go back effectively to getting an understanding that HIMSS is an organization that really drives thought leadership. It utilizes and has analytics that is used all around the globe about how people are deploying technology and what they're doing with it. It has an amazing media team that has magazines and HIMSS television, which is very great and component. We have professional development our government relations team is working with governments around the globe to figure out what we can do in digital health to support them. And we get all the way down to informatics and standard settings, components that we already talked about. All of those elements are how HIMSS brings together to sort of aggregate, if you would, or congregate leadership in health from around the globe. And it's quite amazing. I mean, we have all the tool sets that you're going to see at the global conference, including the global, because this year there's over 40 countries that are represented, the most countries ever. This is the largest delegation from around the globe. Ministers of health are going to be there, leaders in our own government here in the United States for HHS. ONC will be up on stage talking. This is the single largest gathering of healthcare leadership from a government, private, public, nonprofit environment in the world. And so when you walk in, you see two parts. And the full name is the Kim's Global Exhibition Conference and, and Conference. And so what you're looking at is a conference taking place with people sharing strategies, ideas, challenges of healthcare across the way. And then it's the whole exhibition which includes over 1,000 companies that are gonna be showing you products and services that are here, now, ready to go, scalable and fitting your needs. So technicians, people from the clinical side, the policy side are all gonna be there, all about innovation, investments, patient advocates, providers and market suppliers. So when you walk in, the reason it's 30 to 40,000 people is because they're all coming together to think about how do we approach the global health ecosystem? Well, that's beautiful. I encourage everybody to, to uh, uh, attend uh, one of the HIMSS conference in the future, particularly if you want to see how digital health um, affects yourself or the places that you work for. Uh, before I ask my very last question, Hal, um, where do pe people go to find more about what Hims does or a little bit more about you? Well, I don't know about me, but definitely go to hymns.org to find out about Hims. You know, our vision is to realize the full health potential of every human everywhere. That is our foundational uh, calling. It gets to health equity. And it really is about impacting the entire globe. And our mission statement is to reform the global health ecosystem through the power of information and technology. Um, if you have any opportunity, please go to Kim's meetings. We're in 59 different chapters and organizations and communities around the world. We'd love to have you as a member. It's important work that we do as a global nonprofit. Let me make sure everyone understands that. Uh, it's terrific. Um, as far as I go, you know, um, do what you normally do when you research anyone, but trust me, it's not about how Wolf in any way, shape or form. It is about the 122,000 plus members 
that I have the incredible opportunity to represent in moments like this. Well, thank you so much for just being so humble. And I share the same aligned vision of elevating human health and potential around the world. You know, I know you've seen a lot of different modalities that are out there, both in technology and potentially some even lifestyle. Uh, this is the question I ask of, of all my guests, but in your entire lifetime, with all of your experiences, what has been your best medicine? Laughter. Mm. It absolutely remains the best medicine. Um, try to find humor in everything. I'm I'm a fan of a quote I learned many years ago from the great French philosopher Voltaire, who said, God is a comedian playing to an audience that's afraid to laugh. Mm. Now, what sits behind that is no matter what tragedy that befalls you or opportunity or whatever stresses you out, and we're all human, that's about being it. If you looked at it from the outside, you'd probably chuckle at it if it was in a sitcom or something of that nature. So we have to gain our own perspective in life. But you know what? Find a way to laugh a couple times a day. I think it's the greatest thing you can do for a long life and a happy life. That's beautiful. That's one of the things that I promote as well. Hal Wolf, thank you so much for being on the Thrive State Podcast. I look forward to meeting you in person. Honor. We'll look forward to seeing you next week in Chicago. And thanks for having me. I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Thrive State Podcast. And if this podcast is bringing a lot of value to you, if you find that your life is just improving with this podcast, that your life is getting to the next level, please consider supporting it. And here's a few ways you can do so. You can do so by liking this video and commenting on this video and also sharing this video with your friends and family. Another thing you can do is go to ratethispodcast.com slash ThriveState. Go ahead and leave us a five-star review there. It will really, really help your show grow. And it, this will give me more time so that I could actually give more content to you just like you got in this episode. And if you haven't already picked up a copy of my book, Thrive State, your blueprint for optimal health, longevity, and peak performance. You can pick it up now. It became a number one new release in longevity. Go to thrivestatebook.com. And if you enjoy the book, please consider leaving us a review as well. And the last thing you can do if you're liking everything here and you want to work uh, more closely with me as well as my team to get you into the Thrive State, Go to kianvu.com slash accelerator and consider joining the home course, the Thrive State Accelerator. It's really the course that I use. It's the concepts that I use personally when I work with CEOs, celebrities, and my high profile clients to get them to the Thrive State. Again, the Thrive State Accelerator at kianvu.com slash accelerator. And because you're a listener of this podcast, I want you to save 25% by using the coupon code podcast25. I hope we continue to give value to you. And remember always, you are your best medicine.